Hey, there I am. Hey, how are y'all doing? Good. Hey, my name is Alex, and I'm one of the pastors here, and I'll just add my welcome onto that of Clay's. We are so excited that you're here today, especially if you're visiting with us. And I know we have some visitors because I've met you already, and so we're glad that you're here. As I like to say, you're around some of the friendliest people. Uh, in all of East Texas. And so we're, we're glad that you're here. And uh, our mission, you're going to hear a little bit more about that mission today, is to worship God, to share Jesus Christ, and to build believers. Uh, and if so if that sounds interesting to you, or having a personal relationship with Jesus, or uh, being part of a faith community that's building one another up, uh, we'd love to tell you more about that, which is why well, we'd love to hear from you and have a connection card from you. Um, before I continue on, I do want to give a shout out. If you weren't here last week, uh, we had youth takeover, student takeover. It was an incredible day. Students were greeting people at the doors and helping serve communion and ushering and doing all the things. And uh, Toby Palmer, our director of students, shared an excellent message. Our students led in worship. It was an incredible Sunday, and we experienced baptism. Uh, So we had a a couple that were baptized last week, an incredible, incredible Sunday, a great way to either end the summer or start the fall, whatever you prefer, however you want to say that, Uh, but it was an incredible Sunday, and so I want to say thanks to all of our students who participated in that. It was an incredible, incredible Sunday. Yeah. Uh, You've probably heard this saying before, home is where the heart is. And it's basically a phrase, that phrase, some people would call it a proverb, but it's more like a phrase that implies an emotional state describing our attachment to a physical place, or if not a physical place, at least a place where we feel like we belong. Uh, The concept of home or house is something that connects with many of us deeply, and it's been around for a really long time. In fact, all throughout the Bible, there are many scriptures that refer to God's dwelling place as a house or a home. You might remember from our previous series that we just wrapped up a couple of weeks ago in Genesis, there was this scene where uh, Jacob dreams of the ladder or the stairway or the staircase to heaven, and he mentions God's house. In fact, I'm just going to remind you, I'll refresh you here. It's in Genesis 28. It says, when Jacob awoke from his sleep, he said, surely the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. Verse 17, he was afraid and said, what an awesome place this is. This is none other than the house of God. Throughout the rest of the Old Testament, we're introduced to Um, the tent of dwelling, or what's called the the tabernacle that the nation of Israel were instructed to build, a a place where God would dwell with them in their midst. And then that temporary uh, dwelling gave way to the more permanent dwelling of the temple that Solomon built. And those things, the tabernacle, the temple, were referred to as God's house or the house of God. Even Jesus referred to God's house in the Gospels in Mark 11 He was teaching them. It says, is it not written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations? Throughout the rest of the New Testament, we then see the significant shift in how that word, home or house, is being used. And instead of a building or some kind of structure, we see that the word house or household refers to the body of Christ. Um, to the people of God, to the local church. A few quick examples I'll give you. 1 Timothy 3 says this, but if I should be delayed, Timothy writes, I've written so that you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. In Hebrews, it says, but Christ was faithful as a son over his household, and we are that household if we hold on to our confidence and the hope in which we boast. So here's where I'm going with this. As followers of Christ, as the people of God, we are also people of the house. And since home is where the heart is, we should have an affection, an affinity. If home is where the heart is, we ought to have an affection, an affinity for God's house, the global church, but also we should have an affection and affinity for the local house, Fellowship Bible Church, our house that we're called to be a part of, that we're called to 
partner with and join in on mission with. We're starting this new series today titled Our House, and let me just give you a couple reasons why we're doing this series. Um, One reason we're doing this series is over the last year, we've seen uh, lots of new faces around here. Um, They're coming because you've invited them to, you know, either our our Christmas service or Easter service. You've reached out and you've invited them to one of our our message series or you've invited them to your small group or or you told them, hey, you got to come check out the new pastor, which by the way, today ends that phrase. We no longer say new pastor because today is my one year anniversary at Fellowship Bible Church. Yeah. It's hard to believe it's been an incredible year and Wendy and I look forward to being here many more, but I'm no longer the new guy. The newness has worn off. And so to God be the glory uh, for all of that. So listen, somewhere between 100, 150 people have visited our church in the last 12 months. We've grown, our attendance has uh, increased. And because of all of that, we've got lots of new faces. And it's important to be reminded of what the church and what this church, that's me. I'm just going to tell the guys in the booth, I'm going to adjust my microphone real quick. Too close to my mouth. Okay, now you can turn the volume back up. I apologize. (laughs) Oh, man. So we've got all these new faces around here. It's important to be reminded of what the church and what this church, our house, is all about. Um, Another reason that we need to do a series like this is for those who've been around FBC for a while, uh, and you know this, there's just a tendency over time to forget what the purpose of the church is for and and what our church should be about. And so over the next five weeks, we're going to explore the core values of the local church, at least five of those core values. And let me just give you a quick snapshot of the ones that we're going to review, okay? So that you got some sense of where we're headed. Um, Today, we're going to talk about um, that our house ought to be a house where lives are changed, where where people experience transformation, life transformation. That's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, Next Sunday, we're going to talk about how our house is a house of discipleship. In subsequent weeks, we'll talk about uh, our house being a house of evangelism, of worship, and then we'll uh, end this series with the idea that our house is built on God's Word. That's kind of a quick flyover of where we're headed. And I need to do a little commercial for something you're going to hear more about next Sunday Um, As we seek to be a people on mission together, right, people who worship God, share Jesus Christ, and build believers, we're going to launch a new discipleship initiative this fall called DNA, DNA, DNA groups. Uh, A DNA group, ideally, is a a same-gendered, same-sex, same-gender group, two two to three men, uh, three women who meet regularly for the purpose of of being known and to bring the gospel to bear in each other's lives. It's not about being a better person, you're better than someone else because you're in a DNA group, or you're less than because you're not in a DNA group, but it's about giving ourselves the opportunity to be transformed through the gospel of Jesus. And I'm letting the cat out of the bag now because um, we're going to talk about it next Sunday, but we're also going to host a training session uh, on this topic in three weeks, two weeks, uh, September 1st. It's Labor Day weekend at the nine o'clock hour. Instead of all of our normal adult classes, we're actually taking a break from adult classes the next two Sundays. And then on September the 1st at 9 a.m. right here in the worship center, uh, everyone's invited, but we're going to talk more about DNA group CJ White is going to lead us in in that discussion, but we're going to talk more about what they are and how we're going to implement them into our discipleship strategy and and discipleship pathway here at FBC. And so I hope to see all of you there on Sunday, September 1st at 9 a.m. Was that a good enough commercial, CJ? Awesome. I told him I need to do a commercial because he's going to do the infomercial next Sunday. And so anyway, we hope to see you there on Sunday, September 1st. With that said, if you have your Bible, Would you turn with me to Romans chapter 12? Romans chapter 12, we're just going to camp out on two verses today, and I want to talk about our house being a house where lives are changed. Um, You may have heard this name before. There was a man named Heraclitus. He's an ancient Greek philosopher who lived in Ephesus in 500 BC, so 2,500 years ago, 
And he is the one, Heraclitus is the one who's credited with the saying, there is nothing permanent except change. Does anyone else find it fascinating that that phrase, that idea, that thought has been around for 2,500 years? can't believe that was the first time that that was said. It's been around forever. And the reason that resonates with us is because we know that change is just a part of life, right? Change happens around us. Change happens to us. Change can come in many forms. It can come on suddenly or it can come on slowly, right? It it can overwhelm us like a tidal wave that just comes crashing down on us or change can be slow moving like a a glacier. But it's inevitable, we all know this, that change is going to come, it's going to happen at some point. And so today I want to talk to you about change, but not about an outward change. I want to talk to you about what the Bible calls transformation or being transformed. It's the type of change that happens in the heart. It's an inward change that produces an outward change, that leads to life change. Since 1981, by God's grace, Fellowship Bible Church has been a place where lives have been changed. Countless lives have been changed in this place. Some of you have come to know the Lord in this place. You heard the gospel for the first time in this church, and it has changed your life forever. Some of you were baptized in this church. Some of you have grown and matured in your faith, and so maybe you made a faith commitment as a child, but you really stepped into your own and owning your faith while you were being discipled here at Fellowship Bible Church. Some of you have been married in this place. Some of you met your spouse here. And if we're honest, and I think we all know this, it's really not about the building. It's really about the people. Right? It's really not about the property. It's not about the real estate. It's about the community. It's about a spiritual connection where we connect in community with people who are pursuing the God together, this God that passionately pursues the lost. And in Romans 12, there's two verses at the beginning of the chapter that I want to look at with you today. And for those taking notes, uh, I want to list four characteristics from these two verses of this kind of change, of life transformation. So here's what the Apostle Paul writes. By the way, not just to one church, but five separate churches scattered throughout Rome. Here's what he writes in verse 12. He says, or chapter 12, verse 1, he says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. In those two verses, I find at least four characteristics of life transformation. And the first one's pretty simple. If you're taking notes, it's this. Life change is possible. Life change is possible. In fact, Paul gives a command here. Uh, It's an imperative. He says, be transformed. Right, so, so let's just consider that word transform for a second. The word in the original language, I'm going to say it, and you're going to recognize it uh, immediately. It's English equivalent, equivalent immediately. Uh, the word in the Greek is this, metamorpho. Metamorpho. Our English word is the word what? Metamorphosis. That's right. And according to the dictionary, metamorphosis means this, to change from an immature form to a mature or adult form in distinct stages. To change from an immature form to a more mature or an adult form in distinct changes. So a tadpole that experiences metamorphosis becomes a what? A frog. Yeah, you understand this concept, right? It goes through all kinds of changes, moving from the immature to the mature form. A caterpillar undergoes metamorphosis and and transforms into a what? Yeah. So used here in this text, it describes a profound and radical change of the inner you. It's the same word that Paul used in, in 2 Corinthians 3 when he wrote this. We are being transformed 
into his likeness, so into the likeness of Jesus with an ever-increasing glory. It's an inward, profound change that occurs. And so here's the principle. The church, our church, our house, ought to be a place where people hear that this kind of change is possible. Our house ought to be a place where people get the message that you don't have to stay the same, that you can change, that, that you can undergo metamorpho, right? Even if you've failed, even if you've fallen, even if you've faltered, that life change, changing your life is possible, right? Perhaps you're here today and this is your story. You've committed your life to Christ and you've blown it. Right? And then you've recommitted your life to Christ, and then you've blown it again. You might even be at a place today where you think, why do I keep doing this? What is the point? I keep messing up. I'm ready to give up. If that's you, I would just say this. Friend, you need to know that there is a God in heaven, and there are people in this house who are committed to your transformation, who want to see your life change. And sadly, all too often, that is absent from many churches. In fact, I was doing some research um, this week, and I came across an article that grabbed my attention. The title of the article is this, The Church is Not Dying, It's Failing. The Church is Not Dying, It's Failing. And here's a few little snippets of the author um, talking about why people don't go to church anymore or struggle going to church. I don't know if you've been the type of person that's invited your friends or neighbors or coworkers and they've resisted, but this article is kind of unpacking some of the reasons why. And so here's what the author says. It's not that people aren't interested in God. They're hungry for God. But many have just gotten tired of the petty squabbles or the obsession with the way it used to be. Many people never see the point in going to church because it's not a place that enriched their lives. Just hang on to that thought. I'm going to come back to it. It's not a place that enriched their lives. For some, the concept of God is so tainted by problems that they could not imagine the love of that God. And then the author goes on and says, and that's our problem, not theirs. We've failed to be mature and sincere in our faith, not the other way around. If we can't give people a space to meet the God that wants to meet them, then we have failed our mission. And what got my attention in this article is the motivation that brings people to church when the author writes, they want to enrich their lives. It's like people want change. They want transformation. They, they want their lives enhanced. They want to know that there is hope of something different, that something is being added to their lives. And you might not agree with that motivation, but that's because you're an insider. And that's not what motivates you today. And that may not be what keeps you coming. But those who are outside of the, these walls, who are outside of the faith, need to hear that God's house is a place where life change is possible. The second characteristic is this. Life change is personal. Life change is personal, meaning it has to be something that you're involved with that, that, that happens personally with you. Notice in our text, look at, at verse 1. Paul writes this in verse 1. He says, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship, okay? He says you present your body, you present yourself. Transformation is the result of a personal response to God. Let's explore this a little bit further. The verse actually starts with the word therefore. You've probably seen this before. Surely I'm not the first pastor that's ever said this, right? Probably every pastor that's come before me has said this. But whenever you see a therefore in Scripture, you got to find out what it's. Ah, see, I knew I wasn't the first pastor that's ever said that. When you begin a thought with a therefore, you're referring back to a previous spot. Right? We, we know this. Something that was said or done previously. And so when Paul begins chapter 12 with therefore, brothers and sisters, in the view of the mercies of God, he's actually referring to the previous 11 chapters. So if you'll just turn back to chapter 1. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but let me just give you a sampling of what you can find in the first 11 chapters. 
Paul says this, you've been justified by faith. He says you have access to God. He says you have the hope of heaven. He says you are shaped by your trials and tribulations. He says you have the overflowing grace of God. He says, you have the Holy Spirit. If you're a Christ follower, you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. He says, whether you are a Christian or not, whether you are Jew or Gentile, you've got God's great promises. You can count on him. Right? So those are the mercies of God. And so what what he's writing is, he's saying, therefore, based on all of that which has been done for you, all that God has done for you, I urge you, I'm begging you to present your body, present yourself to the God who can change you. You have to take the step. You have to offer yourself to God. You have to respond to God. That's the thought of this passage. And here's how this happens. And this is where language and grammar are helpful. I mentioned that this is a command. And so when he says, don't be conformed, be transformed. It's what's called the passive imperative mode. And now you're like, oh, great, I'm in English class all of a sudden. So a passive imperative just means this. It means that something or, or someone outside of you is the one that's doing the changing. Okay? It's something that's external. It's something or someone that's outside of you that's the impetus for the change. And who would that be? That would be God. I love the the Phillips translation, how it just kind of translates this verse. It says, don't let the world around you squeeze you into its mold, but allow God to remake you. And so, then Paul says, when you allow God to remake you, to change you, He says, this is your true worship. And so many times we focus on that word worship, but can I just tell you that word true in the Greek is the word logikos, and do you know what that means? It means it's rational. (laughs) And so in other words, Paul's saying the most logical and rational thing that you could do is to turn your life over to the God who can change you. That's your true worship. And so the church then, our house, ought to be a house, a place where people can clearly and personally respond to God. That's why Paul says God can transform you, but you need to be the one to present your body, present yourself to him. I've been so convicted of this lately, actually for a few months, that, 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 that I've been talking with our team internally, and that's why we reordered the service today. Because we want to give a better opportunity near the end of our worship service for people to respond to God and to respond to whatever the Holy Spirit may be doing in us when we gather here each week. And so life change is possible. Life change is personal. Here's the third characteristic. Life change is a process, meaning it doesn't happen overnight. Look at verse 2. He says, do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind, right? So the the use of the word renewing here uh, just means it's continual, okay? It it, it means more than just a a, a one-time thing. It's like it's important to understand that, that life change changes both an event and a process, right? Birth is an event. Growing up is a process, You come to Christ in a moment in time. You believe in him. You are saved. God places you in Christ. You are sealed and secured, ready for heaven. That is the event. You just don't know much yet about being a Christian. Next, after that, comes a transformational process. The first is salvation. These are churchy words. The first is salvation. The second is transformation or sanctification, right? It's the process of becoming holy, being changed into his image inwardly. Something happens instantly, but then there's that slow, steady process of maturing. We talked a moment ago about metamorphosis, right? To change from one form to another in distinct changes, right? So you don't get instant frog, right? It just, you don't take a tadpole, drop it into some, you know, solution and boom, frog. It's it's not, that's not what happens, It goes through these distinct stages, right, of eggs and embryos and then tadpoles and the tadpole grows legs and a tail and then, you know, the tail falls off and then frog. 
<laughs> it takes 28 weeks, by the way, over half a year. So that's the process. And so there's no such thing, I, want, I gotta be clear here, there's no such thing as instant Christianity, right? There's instant belief, there's instant security, there's instant assurance, but transformation, life change is a process. It comes through discipleship, which is what we're talking about next week. Also notice where the change takes place. It says, by the renewing of your mind. Um, the, the Bible often refers to the heart and the mind as the same thing. It's like, it's the inner you. It's, it's the inner you. In fact, Jesus once said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. This is the reason we believe that when you come to church, that you ought to be saturated with the word of God. It's why when we teach, we often do what's called exposition or expository teaching. This is why we look at the meaning of words, and we look at nouns and phrases and passive imperatives because we believe that there's power in the text itself, power that's transforming. And so the mind of the Christ follower, saturated with God's word, is the place where lives are changed. I mean, your mind is transformed as you're exposed to God's truth every day, every week, every month, year after year after year. And all of that sounds good, and it sounds right to you. The hard part is this, and I think we know this, is it requires discipline, doesn't it? I mean, if, if you want to be really good at something, I mean, you have to be disciplined, right? If you, you want to play the guitar, you want to learn how to play the violin or the drums or be good at sports, I mean, it will take hours and hours of practicing that thing or, you know, whatever it is over and over and over again. So you become good at it to become an expert at it, right? It's not like, it's not like I can say, you know what, you know what my dream is? I mean, I, I turned 56 this week. You know what? I dream of swimming in the Olympics. Anybody else been watching the Olympics? It's been on like 24 seven at my house. W Wendy and I are Olympic junkies. I'm not proud of it. I'm just confessing that to you this morning. And so we've been watching the Olympics like crazy. And so it's not like I can stand here before you and go, man, I, I want to I wanna swim in the Olympics one day. And I hope to make the team by next Friday. <laughs> right? It doesn't, it doesn't work that way. Although, if you watch the men's javelin event, I told, I told Wendy, I, Linda, I was like, those guys, they didn't look like athletes. They had dad bods. And I was like, I think I could do that. <laughs> like, that was the one thing. I was like, I think... I think, I think I could throw the javelin. Here's the deal. If you want to swim in the Olympics, you, you have to be in the pool for years and years and years and years. And so to change your life as a follower of Jesus, there's discipline of Bible study, the discipline of prayer, the discipline of, the discipline of fellowship, the discipline of evangelism, the discipline of serving others. Like all of those things will renew your mind and bring transformational change. And then here's the fourth and final characteristic. Life change is practical. The lessons of Scripture are always practical. Notice the end of verse 2. Here's how practical it is. So that, it talks about all of this transformation Paul does, and he says, so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. So again, notice the word that. Everything after the word that is called a result clause. So it could be translated in order that or so that. In other words, if you do this, then that will happen. And so he says, if you renew your mind, the results of the transformation will be the discerning and the understanding of God's will. Like that's the idea that he's presenting here. And one of the most frequent requests that I get as a pastor, that I've heard from people, church members, believers over the years, is how can I know the will of God? How, how can I know what God wants me to do? Pastor, how can I know what, what he has for me? Is there a way that I can know what God wants me to do? And unfortunately, some believers actually think it's some mystical experience to discern God's will. If you sit still for long enough, if you're quiet, maybe light some candles, ask God to speak to you, that eventually you'll hear an audible voice at some point. And listen, I'm not saying you can't hear the audible voice of God. 
But more often, discerning the will of God is a process. It comes by the process of exposing your mind to the word and to the truth of God repeatedly over and over and over. And the result of that repetition is that you'll be able to discern the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. Each one follows the other. We present ourselves to God, and then our minds are, are renewed by the word of God, and then we're able to discern the will of God. And so back to where I started at the very beginning, change is always part of life. My question for us this morning is, in which direction is your life changing? Are you being squeezed, as the Phillips translation said, are you being squeezed into the mold of this world? Or are you being transformed and changed by God? I mean, this is an important question for us to answer because we live in a world with its own forces, its own values, its own media, its own messages, and exposure to all of that can change your values. It can change your values because you and I have a tendency to, to be like what we hear and what we see. And so that's why we need to counterbalance that by offering ourselves with renewed minds, living out the will of God by the Spirit and the truth of God in Scripture. And so being a house where lives are changed means we ought to be a place where we celebrate what that change produces in others, and that is people who are living, walking, and moving together in the will of God. Amen? Amen. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me for just a moment? Father God, we thank you for Paul's word to the church in Rome, and more specifically uh, today, how it applies to our house right here at Fellowship Bible. And so, Father, I, I pray that if there are people here today who say, you know what, I, man, I hear uh, about this kind of life change. I, I know people um, that have claimed uh, that God can change their life. If that's you and you're here today, uh, I, I just pray uh, that today, here in just a few moments, as we enter into a time of prayer, uh, 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 that you would respond to that. That if that's what you're sensing and feeling, that you would act on that today, that you would take the step because life change is personal. And for those of us that are here today, God, that know that, oh man, our security, our, our salvation, our assurance, we know one day uh, we'll be in heaven, but God, we just have felt stymied in our discipleship and in our relationship with you. Uh, would you help us to respond today too? That, that we would be willing to undergo metamorphosis that we would have the discipline to do the things that we know that we ought to do so that our lives will be transformed and that we can be a light of transformation to the world around us. Would you do that work in us? God, we want to respond to you now. 